Hello and welcome back. My name is Anders Larsen. You may not have seen the introductions to statistics or the first part of this video involving data and distributions. You're welcome to watch them at any time. Otherwise, we'll dive in to the next subject of this part two of statistics becoming the topic is analyzer performance and terminology. When we want to explain or how to describe an analyzer performance, there are many things we have to take into account. Calibration range, number of factors, all these kind of modeling themes that are important to describe. Was this calibration based on 20 samples or 2000 samples? That will tell us something about the model. But when it comes to the true output of a validation, the very important validation with an independent data set, we will get to know something about the performance of the analyzer running this current model. And there are many words associated with such a description. Vocabulary is not always the same. A question may arise like, is the analyzer accurate or is it precise? That is typically a trick question and people may say, ooh, now you're just using statistical terms to mud the water, but actually not. Being accurate and being precise are two totally different things. Let's look at this uh, marksman shot. One analyzer shows high precision, grouping of the shots, whereas the other shows an average value right in the spot of bullseye but the precision is a little bit all over the place. A reference method is per definition without a bias. The average value of a number of reference analysis will be defined as the truth, but individually they may not be so. On the contrary, an NIR or any other of these fast analyzers may quite often have a very nice repeatability or precision. Hence, we will see the grouping of the shots, but they may have a systematic error. Stemming from a number of errors in the calibration or validation phase, which we will dive into. There are three terms that I find is important to cover when we describe an analyzer. The accuracy or agreement to the reference method. If we get a result from the analyzer, how close to the truth are we? If I ask the analyzer, what's this result? And I ask for the exact same sample, I ask again, what is the repeatability? Repeatability is the is a thing that will tell us how much noise do we have in the analyzer. Then short-term robustness is also another word for repeatability. Slightly longer term, and this word is also called um, reproducibility. That will mean if, the, if another guy took the same uh, sample or a similar sample to a similar analyzer tomorrow in another lab, would he get on the decimal the same number? No. But what kind of deviation may I account on from this uh, analyzer in given uh, this uh, reproducibility? So these questions are important to answer before we start using uh, such an analyzer for production. The terminologies for agreement is also called accuracy. I actually like agreement, but accuracy is also uh, quite good. But I advise from here, we will use agreement. When it comes to this repeatability, what would happen if the same guy, two minutes after the first result, simply ran the next uh, sample again? We will have words like repeatability, uh, precision short term, I will use repeatability. If we took the sample out and put it back in, that will be more like a short-term reproducibility. If we leave the sample until tomorrow, let another guy run the same sample, pack it into the cuvette, petri dish, whatever tube, then we're looking at slightly longer reproducibility. But all these tests will tell us something about the robustness and quality of the measurements. How close can we run the process to a certain target? How certain are we back to probability that what we produced 
is really on target and very close to an interesting limit where we optimize yield and outcome of the production. Now let's look at a case where we all want the, uh, not when we validate, we want the numbers to sit on a line. The numbers we can see here. This would be what did the NIR say? What did the uh, reference lab say? It's clearly that the red dot does not have a 100% agreement. If it was 100%, it would be on the line. But who is right and who is wrong? Quite often a deviating sample is seen as stemming from the NIR, but it could actually be the reference analysis being slightly off as well. It might be a sampling thing, or it might be if we ask the NIR again, the component, the error component of repeatability would bring it back in. In order to visualize that, we may actually run each of these samples five times. Then it would look like this. If that sample is truly off, then the average of these will be off. Otherwise, it will just be clustering. I work vocabulary-wise with three different calibrations. What we could call the, we would wish it was like this kind of calibration. They look like this. Then the real world calibrations that we hope for are more like cigar shaped. The cigar shape is what we quite often see for real life calibrations. What we do not want to see is the potato calibration. Potato calibration or a shotgun uh, is simply not a good calibration because when we look at this data cluster, all kind of lines will be uh, trailing this. So that's not a good calibration. But all these uh, errors, they will stem from something. So we have to make an error budget. The error budget is another vital terminology working with QNS line. We'll try to match up and see where are the errors coming from. Because this potato shape, or even if we want to improve the cigar uh, rule, as the cigar shape of a calibration, we would want to understand what are the error sources. So again, we would want to look into these contributions. The only uh, way to figure out how this all works is by testing. Testing the repeatability, testing the reference method, not relying on old certificates from, from way back in history. Simply do a good validation of everything, then sit down, look at the results, and now it will be quite clear who is the, um, who is the bad guy here. If we want to improve, where should we attack? Let's look at an example of chicken feet. We have in this case run a number of uh, chicken feet samples for the component of fat. We are told that the reference method is 0.23. What does that actually mean? Is that one standard deviation? Is it a double determination? Is it uh, what kind of a method was it? So when we are told stuff about a reference method, we will have to ask. In this case, it's assumed that it's a one standard deviation uh, error stemming from the reference method, typically seen as the repeatability of the reference method. We can see when, when we validate that the NIR gave certain fat numbers, the lab gave other fat numbers, and we see that they are not identical. Some of the differences are very small, some of them are higher, but that's statistics. We can observe with Excel or a number of other means, we can calculate the average uh, error. In this case, it's zero. It's of course constructed. We'll never hit zero in real life, especially if the data set is as small as this one. Be careful with false biases on small data sets. Just a small warning. But if we have like a hundred, we may start to see that uh, the, the method is generally point something higher on the NIR than the reference lab. But the interesting thing here is the standard deviation between the two. And again, I do not advise to calculate on such a small data set, but for the sake of this class, it's, it's good enough. We see that it's 0.32. So reference method was 
And the result after validation is 0.32. Oh, why is it not as good as the reference method? Well, because there are more error sources working with secondary technologies like NIR. So we will have to look into uh, causes of error. There are typically three major sources. They are the reference method, the repeatability, and then a sampling component. The sampling component simply means the NIR did not see exactly the same uh, sample as the primary method. Especially with rough ground things like chicken feed, we may have smaller particles falling to the bottom of a petri dish or in some rotary sampling uh, that we simply do not see the same thing as did the reference method. The link between these three can be seen in this formula. So the question is, does it really add up? Well, the first thing we can do is we can test repeatability. Simply leave the same sample in the analyzer and run it eight times. In this case, we see that we ran the sample eight times and the standard deviation was 0.07. So the 0.07 repeatability does not really uh, tell us, explain a majority of the 0.32. So there must be other things. In this case, we could go back and re revisit if the 0.23 is really uh, what we get from the reference method, but otherwise the sampling component is quite often where we want to uh, look further into. So in this case, we can reverse engineer the, um, the statistics and we can come up with a sampling error of 0.22. Of course, in this example, I have overdone it slightly, but we will quite often see that sampling error has the same scale of magnitude as the reference method, especially for heterogene um, products. So if we want to improve the 0.32, we will have to improve not repeatability, because that was a minor thing here. We'll have to improve sampling, sample presentation, preparation of sampling, a good link to the reference method, and eventually consider uh, running double determinations uh, by the reference method if we want to improve the method. In this way, we will constantly hit the highest uh, error source and get the most improvement for our money. So in summary, we have looked at vocabulary. We now know that we can speak about agreement, repeatability, and uh, robustness or reproducibility. And we all know what it means. And when it sits in a report, we can much better understand where uh, stuff comes from. And in this way, we can develop very nice methods based on NIR. Have fun with spectroscopy. And remember, awesome spectroscopy rocks. Thank you.